Hi, boys and girls, and all you who are young at heart like I am. Welcome. I'm Aunt Carol, and I'm ready to read Chapter 6 of Looney Coon. I hope you're enjoying this story as much as I am. Uh, I like animals, and I hope you do too. So here's Chapter 6. It is called Grandma Honker et al. The morning mail brought a welcome letter. It was postmarked from a small town back in the woods about a hundred miles north of us. The handwriting was large and rough and our names were misspelled. However, we knew the sender and opened the letter eagerly. Ginny read it aloud. Dear folks, you better go ahead and get up here fast. Grandma Honker has come back and is funnier and bossier than ever. You have gotta see her play with my two otters, Mike and Ike. They are both she's, but I call them that anyway. Hurry up, yours, Warden Ollie. Warden Ollie, bless his heart, Ginny exclaimed. How good to hear from him. And Grandma Honker is back, I added. Do you remember her? Do I? She's the largest Canadian goose I ever saw. And the cutest, and the funniest, and sauciest. Ginny's recollection came with enthusiasm. Sam, we must drive up there. Just to see our friend Warden Ollie was sufficient inducement to make the drive. He was a man of unusual character, strong and as ruggedly honest as the pine trees among which he had lived all his life. His love of nature, and particularly animals, had led him to settle on the shore of a small wilderness lake. He owned a beautiful section of forest land, and he stubbornly refused to sell any portion of it or permit the timber to be cut. Here he had built six log cabins, backwoods style, and the renting of these to vacationers was his only source of income. Warden Ollie had a long name of Scandinavian vintage, but it was too difficult for people to pronounce, so he took the short one by which everyone in the region knew him. He wasn't a game warden, never had been, but his zeal in protecting forest animals had earned him the honorary title. He was a keen and careful observer of animal ways, and naturalists of high scholastic standing respected his conclusions. His age he never told, but we gathered that he had worked in logging camps more than 60 years ago. Yet his posture was upright. His hair and dense crop of whiskers were barely tinted with gray. His stride in the woods was a challenge to the hardiest man. Warden Ollie was intensely religious, and while he seldom talked about it, his philosophy was reflected in his actions. He lived alone and liked it. Alone? He said once when someone tried to sympathize with him. Why, I go ahead and have more friends than you do in the city. I got birds that call on me every morning and deer that go ahead and follow me like dogs and a fox that comes to my door. And my friends never talk about me behind my back, neither. Bet yourn do. Jenny and I laughed as we recalled how he used the phrase, go ahead, apparently for emphasis, but often in the oddest places. Though Warden Ollie had lived long among rough men, he had never been known to swear. Sometimes when he wanted to describe something very special, he would lengthen his pet phrase to, Go ahead in there. Remember when he said that Grandma Honker was the best go ahead in there goose in the North Country? I asked, laughing. Yes, and I remember he thought a certain sunset was, Go ahead in there beautiful. <laughs> then Jenny's eyes lighted with anticipation. Do you know what we ought to do? What? Take the X with us. They'd love Warden Ollie and he'd love them. Maybe Grandma Honker would help Dorothy understand animals. A grand idea. Let's ask them and pray that Grandma's in a good mood when we go. The X were all for it. We called at their cabin the morning we were on our way to Warden Ollie's. Briefly, we told them about the old woodsman and his letter. Would they like to go? Would they? The very cabin vibrated with their enthusiasm. In 15 minutes by the clock, they were ready, and we were headed down the highway. Oh, you're wonderful to take us along, Dorothy exclaimed. Yes, wonderful, Dick said in his soft voice. Wonderful, echoed Sonia, charged with excitement. Dorothy, Dick, and Sonia, we called them now, and they called us Ginny and Sam. Last names are a nuisance among friends. We drove over a 100 miles of lovely North Country roads, and then turned off the main highway and down the narrow winding lane that led to Warden Ollie's homestead. Ollie was there to greet us. He emerged from the back door of his cabin and walked toward our car with a stride that covered the distance quickly. 
he looked like a typical lumberjack. Though the day was hot, he wore a wool shirt. The sleeves were rolled up halfway to his elbow. His trousers were supported by bright red suspenders, and the cuffs were rolled well above the ankles, revealing his moccasin-type boots. His hair and whiskers were about as tangled as a hazel brush thicket, with no two hairs pointing exactly the same way. The ex had been warned about his candor. He had a well-deserved reputation of saying just what came to his mind, regardless of how it sounded to others. As soon as one understood him, his manners were not offensive. But the first experience was often quite a shock. I recall what he said when I was introduced to him months before. Howdy, he blurted. You're just a sawed-off shrimp, ain't ye? I don't see how you go ahead and get about the woods with them short legs of yourn. You must go ahead and spend half your time astraddle a log. To little Sonia, he gave a smile that spread his whiskers all about the compass. Pleased to meet you, Sonia, he said. About all I miss round here is a nice young'un like you. I'm glad to meet you too, Warden Ollie, she replied. Dorothy Eck didn't fare so well. Why all the fine toggery? he asked, a twinkle in his eyes. Did you think you was a-going someplace? Them duds fit here about like an orange tree would. Dick Eck got a blunt reception. Eck? Eh? said Warden Ollie as he shook hands. Ain't much of a name, but it's easy to say, and I guess you know what it means. Yes, I answer to it, Warden Ollie, said Dick. We're grateful for the privilege of coming to your place and hope we're not intruding. Nope, nope, glad you came. Hope you go ahead and come often. Warden Ollie smoothed his rebellious whiskers and pushed his hair back, but whiskers, hair, and all resumed their former disheveled position immediately. How'd you make a living, Eck? he asked bluntly. I'm an engineer. Dick said, smiling. You mean on a railroad? Warden Ollie motioned as if pulling a whistle cord. No, I build things. Oh, I get it. Well, good for you. That's nice work. You know, I'm sort of that way myself. I built every one of those go-ahead in their cabins and not one of them leaks. Warden Ollie, Sonia broke in. Where is Grandma Honker? Warden Ollie's expression changed to a smile that even his whiskers couldn't hide. So you been a hearing about Grandma, have ye? He said, turning to walk toward his lake. Suppose Sam and Ginny have been telling you. Come along, we'll find Grandma. The cabins Warden Ollie had built were of heavy logs and presented a most sturdy appearance, but with no architectural niceties and refinements. Those he rented out were located down the lake shore, reached by a winding path that circled among stumps and trees and over bumpy roots and stones. The cabin in which he lived was larger than the others. The interior was one large room, a combination of library, laboratory, museum, and living quarters. Precious little of it was devoted to living quarters. In one corner was a cot on which he slept, a low wood stove for heating and cooking, and a few dishes and supplies. The rest of the room was filled with cabinets, crowded bookshelves, relics of early logging days, files, and a desk on which rested a microscope. Ollie showed us about his cabin with considerable pride. Obviously, he loved his home. From the shelves, he took volume after volume inscribed to him by various authors. He had us sign his guest book. You'll go ahead and be in good company there, he assured us, pointing out names of prominent people from every walk of life who had visited his place. How clean his cabin is, Dorothy whispered to me on the side. There isn't a speck of dirt anywhere. Have you seen my goes in it and goes out it? Ollie asked suddenly. Your what? I asked. My goes in it and goes out it, Ollie repeated. Here it is, back of the stove. He led us to where we could see a hole about a foot square cut in the floor. That's it, he said with an air of satisfaction. My animal goes in it and then they go out it. Saves me opening the door a hundred times a day. Now, who in the world uses that entrance? Dorothy asked. Oh, my fox, my otters, my cat, my rabbit. A bear used to come in, but he got too big. Gone wild now, like he ought to. I never know who'll go ahead and call on me. Dorothy shuddered a little and backed away from the hole, but Ollie didn't notice. Well, let's go find Grandma, he said, leading the way out his front door. Between his cabin and the lake lies a large grassy area. At the shore were some boats pulled partly out of the water, a pier, and a small log boathouse. 
He led us toward the lake across this yard, calling constantly, Hi, Grandma! Come on, yo hunker! Here's someone wants to see ye! Grandma Hunker didn't respond at once, though other creatures did. From under the cabin came a large cat named Tom, and with him, Nipper, a red fox. They crossed the lawn in a series of scuffles, the cat getting the worst of it. There was Peg Leg, a one-legged grackle whose life Ollie had saved three years before and who returned to his homestead each spring. There were Maggie, the pet crow, Pat, the red-headed woodpecker, and Joe, the raven. Ollie greeted them all, tossing them tasty bits from a supply of food he always carried in his pocket. Go on about your business, he grumbled. I wasn't to call in you. I want Grandma. Where you put her? He called for the Canadian goose again, but out of the brush came Bigfoot, a huge snowshoe rabbit, and an assortment of chipmunks and squirrels. Sonia was in her glory. She gave her attention to one animal after another, emitting a constant flow of laughter and squeals of delight. Trouble with these critters is they don't have a lick of sense, Wally Orden pretended to grumble as he gave Sonia some food to share with the animals. All the books say a cat is supposed to kill chipmunks and squirrels, and look at old Tom. He just wants to play with them. And that fox, he's just plain dumb. Books say he feeds on birds like old grandma, but he's just plain crazy about her. He go ahead and follows her around, and sometimes I find them curled up asleep together. That's a whole trouble. These animals are ignorant. They never go ahead and read any books, so they don't know how to be animals. Warden Ollie straightened up and looked at us with a strange, squinting expression. I'd seen him do this before and learned that when he spoke at such moments, it was true and worth hearing. You folks go ahead and heard about such things as natural enemies in the forest and instinctive killers. Let me tell you, there ain't no such thing. The cat ain't a killer till he's taught it, likely enough by his ma. The wolf ain't a hunter till he learns it. It's all a matter of learning, and if they can learn one thing, they can learn another. Look, my animals have learned to get along together if they try. Grandma, he blurted impatiently, suddenly remembering the task of the moment. Where are ye? You're getting more stubborn every day. There she is, cried Sonia delightedly as a huge Canadian goose came walking from behind some brush near the shore. Yep, it's Grandma, said Warden Ollie. But wait a minute, watch this. You can see my two otters sunning themselves on the pier. The two animals were stretched out on their backs, looking like miniature seals, apparently enjoying a lazy nap. Are they Mike and Ike? asked Dorothy. Yep, you know them, don't you? Guess Sam and Jenny got you pretty well informed. Now watch Grandma. She could never let anything go ahead and be that comfortable around here. If she sees them, you'll go ahead and see some fun. Grandma Honker saw the two otters all right. As Warden Ollie predicted, she couldn't tolerate such comfort. With her long neck outstretched, she waddled cautiously toward the sleeping Mike and Ike. When within reach of them, she settled to the ground and studied the situation. Carefully, she reached forward and touched Mike's leg with her beak. He jerked the lake away but didn't awaken. She did the same to Ike with a like result. Warden Ollie was chuckling softly as he watched. Back under his whiskers, he kept saying in a half whisper, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead in there. And Grandma went ahead. Suddenly, she gave Mike a savage bite on his tail and quickly gave Ike the same treatment. The two otters, rudely startled out of their sweet dreams, fairly shot up into the air and into the water. Squaw! When Grandma, triumphantly, getting to her feet and waddling down the pier to the shore, the two otters swam about the surface of the lake, snorting and blowing, trying to figure out what had happened to them. All of us were laughing. Warden Ollie the loudest. And folks wonder why I never get lonesome, he said. Something going on here all the time. Grandma's been coming back every year for eight years. She broke a go-ahead in their wing the first time, and I fixed her up. She never forgets. Raised families for six years, but not last year nor this. Too go-ahead old, I guess. But she thinks she owns the place. She's boss here. Sometimes she's a little rough on people, but I just tell them if they don't like Grandma, they can go away. She pesters the daylights out of Mike and Ike, but they like it. Grandma Honker. Oh, you've got to see this picture. 
There she is. She's just bit Mike and Ike on the tail, and they're jumping in the water. I think she thinks it's pretty funny. Grandma Honker was now waddling up toward us, looking back in the direction of Mike and Ike occasionally. Ward and Ollie went to meet her. She pushed her head up against his hand, and he scratched about in the feathers of her neck. Remember Sam and Ginny, Grandma? Ward and Ollie asked. You saw them before. Easy now. Grandma took Ginny's hand in her beak, and Warden Ollie was concerned. A goose can bite mighty hard if it takes a notion, he commented. Easy now, Grandma. Grandma was gentle, but her demeanor showed she considered herself mistress of this place. She was especially cordial to Sonia. Likes children, Warden Ollie commented. If I had a young'un, I couldn't want a better nurse than Grandma. She's better than a watchdog. Warden Ollie was a keen observer of people as well as of animals. He looked sharply at Dorothy, who was watching Sonia and Grandma with obvious concern. Then, in his usual blunt way, he said, You don't like animals, do you, lady? Well, she answered hesitatingly, I like them, that is, in a way. That is, I'm learning to, I hope. Just so as they don't go ahead and get too close, eh? He laughed. Well, I don't blame you. Animals is just no good. Look at this good-for-nothing goose. Someday I'll go ahead and there and tie that neck of hern in a bow knot. As he said this, he began handling the big goose in a careless roughness. He ruffled the feathers of her neck, cupped his big hands about her head, and shook it as if to break it off. Then he deliberately turned the big bird over on her back, scratching through her breast feathers and under her wings as if he meant to tear her to bits. Grandma Honker squawked in loud protest, but she just loved it. The moment Dolly stopped, she got to her feet and came begging for more. See what I tell you, said Ollie, much out of breath. She don't even know she's been abused. Thinks I'm just playing with her. Come here, you varmint. I'll go ahead and show you I mean it. He went after the delighted old bird like a wrestler, tumbling her about the ground even more roughly than before. Finally, he let Grandma get up on her feet and gave her some bits of food from his pocket. She gobbled them greedily. Ollie gave us all some corn so we could feed the goose, too. Even Dorothy joined the circle and seemed to be getting along well with the apparently docile bird. Then I noticed that Warden Ollie showed some worry. Grandma gently nipped at a bracelet Dorothy was wearing. Easy now, Grandma, cautioned Warden Ollie, walking over to her. Grandma returned to the food in Dorothy's hand. Look, Sam, said Dorothy a moment later. How am I doing? I looked and found she was actually petting Grandma with one hand while she was feeding her with the other. She scratched among the feathers of the great bird's neck and stroked her head. It's taking all the nerve I can muster, Dorothy said. I'm proud of you, dear, Dick said, and the three X gathered about Grandma, showering affection on her. I was thinking, you being a builder, Warden Ollie broke in, would you like to see some pictures showing the way we used to build things in old logging camps? I had the first camera in this county, and I took some things nobody else got. Dick was interested, and so were Ginny, Sonia, and I. We followed Warden Ollie to his cabin. Dorothy stayed behind, still feeding Grandma. I'll join you when Grandma has finished. Warden Ollie looked back at the big goose. Easy now, Grandma. Remember what I say. The old lumberjack's collection of pictures was remarkable indeed. The bunkhouses of the lumberjacks, the cook shack, the sleds piled high with logs, the log jams in rivers, he had them all. Some of the films were overexposed, the prints were badly faded, but still they were fascinating. Then he began reminiscing about his early experiences. It was tough in them days, he said, but I wish I could go ahead through them again. No trucks then, no tractors, no good roads. When we went into camp, it was to stay there all winter. We wouldn't see anyone but our own boys till next spring. That camp was a world all our own, and you made some mighty good friends. Once in a while, there was a no good amongst us, but mostly the boys was right. Then when the go-ahead in their spring drive was on, when the logs went down the river, I tell ye, nobody ever saw more go-ahead in their excitement. Listen, Ginny broke in. I think I heard a scream. I did too, Dick said anxiously. Something's happened to Dorothy. We all rushed to the door. It was Dorothy, all right. She was running in circles, screaming at the top of her voice. A few feet behind her was Grandma Honker, yelling to and beating wildly with her wings. Even as we looked, Dorothy made a frantic dash for the boathouse, ran in and slammed the door, Grandma ramming hard against it. Inside the boathouse, we could still hear Dorothy screaming. 
Grandma Honger paced up and down in front of the door like a guardsman, apparently very much annoyed and upset. Ward Nolly was first to reach the scene of battle. Grandma, he scolded, steering the ruffle goose to one side. I'm ashamed of you. I told you to take it easy. She tried to kill me, Dorothy cried as Dick opened the door and brought her out. She went right after my throat, after I'd been feeding her, too. No, she didn't go after your throat, said Warren Nolly, still holding the goose. Grandma hadn't given up her goal and was pecking, peeking around his legs, looking for an opportunity to get at Dorothy again. But she did, Dorothy insisted. She reached right up and took a bite at me. I barely escaped. She wasn't after your throat. Poor Nolly said confidently. It was your necklace. Grandma has go-ahead weakness for jewelry. She loves it. I saw her eyeing it when you fed her. Here, will this satisfy you, Grandma? He took from his pocket a string of sparkling cheap beads and held them out to the excited goose. Immediately, she snatched the beads in her beak and with a little honk of satisfaction, she ran awkwardly away. A short distance off, she dropped them on the ground, looked at them carefully, turned them over several times, then picked them up and carried them on. See, that's what she wanted, War Nolly said triumphantly. She just like all women, like something to splurge with. Wasn't fair of you to have all them jewels you're wearing and her none. She wasn't mad at you. She just wanted you to divvy up. We didn't see much more of Grandma that day. She was too much occupied with her necklace. She went walking back into the woods, carrying her treasure and jabbering about it in goose language. Later, we saw her swimming far out in the lake. Even as we watched, she took flight looking like a plane as she circled high overhead. Finally, it was time for us to start home. Sonia was reluctant to leave, as were we all. You'll come again, won't ye? asked Ollie as we walked toward our car. Grandma will be nicer to you next time now that you're acquainted. And maybe you won't go ahead and get so fancied up, he said to Dorothy. It's best not to tempt Grandma. I'll dress in sackcloth, Dorothy assured him. And bring my little Sonia here, demanded Ollie, placing his arm about the child. This young and is mighty good with animals. Tell you what I'll do, he said mysteriously. If ye come back, I'll go ahead and show ye my big secret. Something I never showed another soul. Will ye? We promised to go ahead in there and come back. And that right soon. Grandma came sailing in just as we left, making a three-point landing near the pier and bade us farewell with a squawk. Well, it's time for me to bid you farewell, hopefully not with a squawk. I'm enjoying this. I hope that Dorothy learns to, to like animals and not be afraid of them. Seems like a neat place to visit. I think I'd like to meet somebody just like um, Warden Ollie, wouldn't you? Well, that's all for now. God bless. Bye-bye.